Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. If you're like us, whenever you finish watching a great new true crime documentary or series, you can't help but immediately go online and try to see if there are similar cases to the one you just learned about. Perhaps it's morbid curiosity, a need to re-experience that sense of mystery, or simply an attempt to reassure yourself that terrible stories like this really don't happen that often. With the release of Netflix's latest docu-series, Once Upon a Crime, which covers the terrifying story of Elise Matsunaga, who murdered her husband Marcos, we decided to once again go down that familiar rabbit hole, and found two similarly frightening stories that we wanted to share with you. Just a heads up, if you haven't seen the doc series, that's totally fine. It's not required viewing to understand either of today's stories. That being said, if you do find today's stories interesting, you'll probably want to check the series out. Before we get to the videos, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel, and if you've watched a few of our videos already, you might not even realize that you're not subscribed. While you're there, don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. With that out of the way, here is part one of two terrifying cases similar to the Elise Matsunaga story. On January 18, 2003, a lawyer named Neil Davis arrived at the district attorney's office in Harris County, Texas with some grim news. He told officials that he had represented a client who had shared information with him about the location of a body. He then gave them an address in the White Oak Bend subdivision on the northwest edge of Houston. When police arrived at the modest suburban home, they found the nude body of one of the homeowners, 34-year-old Jeffrey Wright. He had been buried in a shallow grave in the backyard, which looked like it had been partially dug up by the family dog. Neckties had been knotted around Jeffrey's wrists, and the sash from the bathrobe was tied around one of his ankles. Dozens of wounds were found on the front of his body. It would later be determined that he had been stabbed at least 193 times. Inside the home, there were obvious signs of a cover-up. The house had been cleaned, but evidence of the crime remained, including blood splatter in the master bedroom where it was quickly concluded that the killing had taken place. The bloodstained mattress from the room had been moved into the yard. When authorities asked Davis whether his client was Jeffrey's wife, 26-year-old Susan Wright, he said yes. However, he said that Susan would not be speaking with police at that time. She had been taken to the psychiatric ward of Ben Taub General Hospital. According to Davis, Susan believed that Jeffrey was still alive and that he was coming after her and their two young children. Less than a week later, Susan surrendered to authorities at the Harris County Courthouse and was charged with her husband's murder. The trial that followed would become one of the most sensational in Houston's history and would result in significant controversy that lasts to this day. While there was no doubt that Susan had been the one that killed Jeffrey, it was the circumstances of the killing that would be highly disputed when the case went to court in February of 2004. Drawing on the same set of facts, the defense and the prosecution painted two completely different pictures of Susan and of the night that the killing took place. Susan and her defense team argued that she had suffered horrendous domestic abuse at the hand of her husband for years and that the killing had come after she had finally reached her breaking point. The prosecution, led by attorney Kelly Siegler, maintained that Susan's story of abuse was completely fabricated and that she had instead killed her husband for $200,000 worth of life insurance money. It was self-defense versus cold-blooded murder. Susan's defense lawyers, Neil Davis and Todd Ward, knew that they were fighting an uphill battle in terms of a self-defense argument. Not only did the vicious nature of the killing work against them, but there seemed to be little hard evidence supporting Susan's abuse claims. Friends and family spoke anecdotally about many times in which they thought something might be wrong in their marriage, but the only time Susan had actually gone to the police was the day after she had killed Jeffrey, when she filed a restraining order against him, saying that she feared he was going to attack her and her two children. However, since the restraining order and police report had been filed after Jeffrey's death, it was easy to write them off as simply being a part of Susan's cover-up attempt. This was part of the broader optics problem that the defense team had concerning the case's timeline. While the killing took place on January 13th, a full five days had elapsed by the time Susan called her lawyer and notified him of Jeffrey's body. She had spent the previous days attempting to clean up the crime scene, buying bleach, soil, and other items before burying her husband in a hole in the backyard. The hole was one Jeffrey had dug months earlier for a home improvement project. Because of the incriminating evidence against her, Susan's lawyers made the decision to put her on the stand to tell her side of the story to the jury directly. Through tearful testimony, she explained that her marriage had been a nightmare and that she feared for her life daily. 
Susan had met Jeffrey in April of 1997 on a trip to Galveston with a friend. Their romance had progressed quickly from there. He was a charming person who had taken her to nice restaurants and told her that he loved her not that long after they began dating. Less than a year later, Susan became pregnant with their first child. They married in October of 1998, one month before the birth of their son. According to Susan, that was when Jeffrey changed completely. She alleged that he had got angry when she gained weight during her pregnancy and became even more livid when she was diagnosed with postpartum depression after the birth of their son. Physical abuse soon followed, and she said that Jeffrey tried to control almost every aspect of her life. He forced her to stay home almost all hours of the day, allowing her to leave only for brief visits with her mother and to buy groceries. It was during this time that Susan alleged she also discovered Jeffrey's drug use. He had pleaded guilty to felony drug possession in 1996, but Susan said she had no idea until after they were married. After the birth of their second child in 2001, Susan said she became increasingly concerned about both children's safety because of Jeffrey's rampant abuse of cocaine and marijuana. Meanwhile, the physical abuse apparently got worse, prompted in part by setbacks in Jeffrey's career. His behavior grew more erratic, and he would allegedly do things like throw bricks at Susan in the yard and bash her head on the dashboard of their car during arguments. She said that he also bought an air rifle that he claimed he would use to, quote, keep the family in line. Susan said that she tried to leave Jeffrey before, but in that instant he had called her at her sister's house and threatened to kill her and their son if she did not come back. Susan said that on the night of January 13, 2003, she finally hit her breaking point. It started when Jeffrey returned from a boxing lesson high on drugs and began playing roughly with their son. According to Susan, Jeffrey had punched the young boy in the head, sending him flying back into the couch. When he cried, Jeffrey told him to stop being a sissy. Later that evening, when Susan attempted to discuss the incident with Jeffrey, she said that he had attacked her, beating her, and sexually assaulting her. She claimed that he then grabbed a butcher's knife and started waving it at her. Susan claimed that she managed to knee her husband in the groin and wrestle the weapon away from him, after which she began stabbing him. She said that she kept going because she was convinced that he would get up at any second and kill her. She stopped briefly to tie his hands to the bedpost, grabbed another knife, and kept going. She said the rest of the fabric tied to Jeffrey's body was from when she strapped him to a dolly to move his body outside. She described her mental state after that as being like in a fog, one that she claimed had lasted for days. She said throughout the time that she cleaned up the crime scene and disposed of the body, she remained convinced that Jeffrey would get up any second and start attacking her again. To counter Susan's harrowing story, the prosecution focused on two major strategies, attacking Susan's allegations of abuse and painting a vivid picture of the viciousness of the killing for the jury. As previously mentioned, there was little hard evidence of the abuse in the Wright's marriage, and this was quickly latched onto by prosecutor Kelly Siegler. Siegler pointed out that Susan's only documented proof came after she had already killed her husband, and was therefore not credible. She also offered character witnesses from Jeffrey's friends and family, who rebuffed claims that he was capable of the abuse that Susan had described. But it was the second strategy that Siegler employed at trial that proved to be particularly effective. In order to paint a vivid picture of the brutality of the killing, she had authorities bring in the Wright's actual bed to the courtroom, complete with the bloodstained mattress where Jeffrey had been killed. Siegler's theory of the case was that on the night of the killing, Susan had seduced her husband into bed under the pretense of a romantic evening and had tied his hands and feet to the bedpost as part of the scheme. Once restrained and helpless, she alleged that Susan began the attack. As part of Siegler's courtroom reenactment, she tied a male colleague to the bed and straddled him while inflicting mock stab wounds with the actual murder weapon. She made sure to point out the sheer number of stab wounds, remarking that it would have taken a long time to stab someone 193 times, and asked Susan if her arm had gotten tired. She theorized that Susan had wanted the $200,000 in life insurance money from her husband's policy, and that the entire story she had told the court was an elaborate lie. Ultimately, the jury sided with the prosecution, and Susan was convicted of murder in March of 2004. She was sentenced to 25 years in prison. However, this was far from the end of the case. Though many in the public were now 100% convinced that Susan had made up her abuse allegations to cover up her true motive, a lawyer who had watched much of the proceedings saw something different. The man's name was Brian Weiss, one of Houston's most prominent appellate attorneys. For Weiss, Susan's story seemed like a classic case of something known as battered woman syndrome a psychological condition exhibited by people who have suffered prolonged violence from an intimate partner. In many of these cases, victims come to believe that their only reasonable course of action is to kill their abusers. Over the next few years, Weiss helped Susan appeal her case, and in 2009, two court decisions resulted in her sentence being thrown out. 
Importantly, the conviction in the case still stood, but Weiss argued that there were mistakes made by both the prosecution and Susan's lawyers that resulted in an unfair sentence. On the prosecution side, Weiss heavily criticized the trial tactics of Kelly Siegler, saying that her wild reenactments amounted to, quote, made-for-TV nonsense. On the part of the defense, Weiss argued that Susan's lawyers had failed to present basic facts that could have resulted in a lighter sentence. At the new sentencing hearing, Weiss solicited the testimony of one of Jeffrey Wright's former girlfriends, who admitted to experiencing much of the same horrifying abuse that Susan had described at trial. Weiss also criticized Susan's defense team for failing to properly explain the clinical explanation for the trauma she was suffering, saying that they provided ineffective assistance for not bringing a single expert on domestic violence to testify at the trial. Furthermore, he argued that they should have solicited the testimony of the doctor that had treated Susan when she was admitted to the psychiatric ward before her arrest. At the end of the new hearing in late 2010, Susan had five years knocked off of her 25-year sentence, leaving her eligible for parole in just over three years from that point. She was denied parole twice, once in 2014 and again in 2017, but eventually it was granted in the summer of 2020. Susan was released from prison on December 30th, 2020, after serving 16 years in prison. Understandably, the decision remains controversial. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.